So welcome. Um, we just pushed record and this session is on open pedagogy and EDI, student created open content and marginalized representation. It's a part of the winter 2020 virtual professional development series that we're doing at UNCG libraries. I am just here to moderate. My name is Sam Harlow. I'm the online learning librarian. And without further ado, here is Melody Rude, the student success librarian at UNCG libraries. Hello, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my video, but I just wanted to introduce myself with video on first, just in case you don't know me. Um, my name is Melody Rude. I'm the Student Success Librarian, and I'm going to be talking about open pedagogy and EDI. All right, so uh, before we begin, I do want to preface this webinar by saying that um, I'm not a critical race scholar. Uh, and like many people, I am still in the process of learning things about EDI issues. Um, but with that being said, uh, you know, EDI issues are an inherent part of my life, both in and out of the workplace. So it is a very important topic for me. So I just want to let you know that I might not have the answers to everything if there's any questions um, that I feel like are sort of out of my scope. Alrighty. So uh, to begin, I'd like to um, look at this question here. Why does representation matter? Uh, and if you could, um, I would love to hear some thoughts on this either in the chat or you can feel free to unmute yourself and just talk about it. But I kind of just want to gauge how we're feeling about this. Um, and if you've never actually thought about it, uh, like it, you can say that as well. Like, you know, this is something that I never really uh, thought about. So. Can we just take a couple minutes to maybe say something or put something in the chat about this? Yeah, Joe, it can make you feel included and welcomed in a community. Absolutely. Everyone deserves to be seen in literature and academics. Absolutely. In all things, yeah. We got some agreement on that. Yeah, Nikki, if one can't see, one can't be. It's how we know each other. These are great. Yeah, this is one of those questions where, you know, there's, there's not uh, one right answer uh, because it's so um, layered. Well, I'll just say that, you know, um, you know, this is something that we could spend uh, a whole webinar talking about just why representation matters, but we don't have that kind of time today. But I did want to spend some time with it because I think jumping into a conversation about how to make open content more exclusive without really addressing why would be a disservice to this topic. Um, so a couple of my thoughts um, I would say that the first thing is there is plenty of evidence, literature, and personal testimony about how insidious of an impact a lack of representation can have on marginalized and oppressed populations. Um, and then the other thing is that, so in terms of race, I know representation can mean many things, but sort of speaking from the perspective of race, I think one of the major issues um, with a lack of representation is that it continues to uphold the idea that whiteness is neutral and it's the standard and it's unmarked. So when you disrupt that narrative, you get people who are upset because they sort of feel like, um, like diversity is being forced onto them. So I'm sure you can probably think of a couple of examples from the media where there was backlash for casting an actor of color for a role that was imagined as white. So not even uh, specifically addressed that way, um, it was just assumed unless stated otherwise. So what, what does that really mean when you break that down? So um, I think that when you break it down, what it's saying, you know, if, if whiteness is sort of neutral, then not being white is automatically marked and inherently political, uh, whereas whiteness gets to remain neutral. And the problem with that is that the reality of whiteness does not apply to everybody. So when you think about how people might feel if they grow up never seeing their history or uh, people who look like them on TV 
or if they do, it's it's based on harmful stereotypes, or maybe you know their their family's history is boiled down to a single paragraph in their like middle school history book, and they never actually get to learn more than that. You know, eventually that person might feel like their story and their history is not worth being told, and that if it is, it might be being told by somebody who maybe doesn't have the authority to be doing so. So again, this is something that we can spend all day talking about, but we don't really have time. But I did want to sort of uh, put those thoughts out there and uh, allow everyone to sort of sit with that and think about that throughout this presentation. So uh, before we begin, this is, I just you know, want to preface by saying this is not an OER webinar, but I do want us to all sort of be on the same page about what open educational resources are. So this is the definition that we use on our LibGuide. And it says open educational resources, OER, can be any type of material or resource used for teaching available in the public domain that is free to use and or alter. So when we talk about OER, you'll often hear conversations about textbooks. And for good reason, because using open educational materials uh, you know, provides a free alternative to traditional textbooks, which have increased over 800% in the last 30 years. So that has surp uh, surpassed the increased cost of medical services and new home prices. So that's a really high impact on saving student money, st saving students money. Um, and that's why it's sort of a huge part of OER advocacy. Um, but just like it's stated here, OER isn't just textbooks. They can be uh, any educational material uh, like a syllabus, um, guides, videos, and so on. So again, um, I'm not gonna spend too much time with OER, but we do have a webinar tomorrow at 2 p.m. Um, that's gonna talk about OER at UNCG. So definitely check that out. Uh, you can still register for that. Okay, so what makes something open? So something is tr truly open if it has these five R's. So the ability to retain, revise, reuse, remix, and redistribute. Um, so if you sort of think about that um, practically, uh, it could be like somebody creates an educational resource and they have licensed it to be uh, in OER, they've used a Creative Commons license. So allowing it to be fully open. So then you could uh, take that, make a copy of it if you wanted to. You could translate it into a different language. You could combine it with other open resources, add new items to the resource, cut aspects of it out and distribute it to others uh, among other things that you can do with it. So this is sort of what really separates OER from things that you can just access freely online. So. Uh, replacing a textbook in a classroom with permalinks uh, to articles from our library's database is a really great free alternative that saves students money. And, you know, we love that, but it, like technically, um, unless those articles are in an open access journal, they're not technically open because we're still paying for those through um, the library databases. So that's something to keep in mind. And how open something is, is going to depend on the Creative Commons license, which Again, I'm not going to really get into that, um, but you can um, license the work to, to be you know, less open or more open, depending on what you want uh, to do with it. Uh, so that's just a little recap of OER and the five R's. So now that we've gone over that, I want to discuss uh, the connection between social justice and open education. So this is information from the work of Sarah Lambert who wrote the article, Changing Our Discourse, A Distinctive Social Justice Aligned Definition of Open Education. And I have that um, citation down at the bottom there. So Lambert proposed that there are three principles of social justice as it applies to open education. And those are redistributive justice, recognitive justice, and representational justice. So let's take a look at this first one, redistributive justice. So this can be defined as the allocation of resources to underserved populations. So in this scenario, uh, it would be those most likely impacted by expensive educational materials. So saving students money would fall under this category. Uh, but it's not just about the literal cost, but also the cost of student success. 
We know from research that the cost of required textbooks has directly contributed to students never purchasing the materials, taking fewer classes, earning a poor grade, dropping, and even failing a class. So in my experience, most conversations about open education and OER specifically sort of revolves around this principle, um, which we know is really important because it has that high impact on saving students money and it increases the chances of students to succeed academically. So that's redistributive justice. Um, the next principle is recognitive justice, which according to Lambert explores the socio-cultural diversity in an open curriculum. So because of the five R's, you know, the ability to revise, reuse, remix, and so on, a resource can be created or adapted to be more inclusive. Um, so that's, you know, maybe uh, including more diverse views, updating language and terminology, because we know that uh, language changes and what might be acceptable, you know, 20 years ago might not be the same language that's used today in certain um, groups. Uh, it could just be um, um, exchanging some images for more inclusive images that show uh, BIPOC folks, which is Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, so that's recognitive justice. So it's sort of making things more inclusive because there's that ability to uh, revise and remix. So the last principle is representational justice, which is similar to recognitive justice, but it takes it sort of a step further. So in Lambert's words, it allows opportunities for marginalized populations to speak for themselves and not have their stories told by others. And this is where we get into open pedagogy, although open pedagogy can be recognitive as well. But you know, I wanna emphasize it here because we're talking about representation. Um, so in the representation aspect um, of you know, justice, social justice is what this webinar is about. So um, that's something that uh, is representational justice, but also it recognizes students as creators of knowledge, which is very important. So just to recap, social justice as it applies to open education can be seen through redistributive justice, recognitive justice, and representational justice. All right, so what is open pedagogy and how does it relate to social justice? Well, we kind of talked about that with the representational justice and we'll see it sort of more in practice with the examples that I'll show, but what is open pedagogy? So this is a definition from the Open Pedagogy Notebook and it says open pedagogy as we engage with it is a site of praxis, a place where theories about learning, teaching, technology and social justice enter into a conversation with each other and inform the development of educational practices and structures. Um, so to kind of simplify that, um, it's putting into practice theories around learning, which include teaching, technology and social justice and using that to inform how somebody teaches and what they're teaching with. So this is a more like theoretical definition, um, but we'll sort of cover what that practical application will look like in a minute. So open pedagogy actually overlaps with many learning theories, um, but one that really stands out is constructivism, uh, which is uh, an approach uh, to learning that holds that people actively construct or make their own knowledge and that reality is determined by the experiences of the learner. So some um, major components of constructivism are knowledge is socially constructed, learning is an active process, knowledge is personal, students are collaborators of knowledge, and learners can contribute knowledge into something tangible and public, which I think that last one really aligns with open pedagogy as you'll see that it's sort of about adding to the curriculum. So um, you can probably think of other um, learning theories or pedagogies that where some of these things overlap. I know there's some overlap with uh, the ACRL framework that librarians like to use, um, but I thought that constructivism really um, aligned well with um, open pedagogy. So keeping in mind that more theoretical definition, we're gonna look at what that looks like in practice. And to do that, we're gonna look at the difference between disposable and renewable assignments. So a disposable assignment, according to this quote, these are assignments that students complain about doing and faculty complain about grading. 
There are assignments that add no value to the world. After a student spends three hours creating it, a teacher spends 30 minutes grading it, and then the student throws it away. Not only do these assignments add no value to the world, they actually suck value out of the world. That's, that's a pretty bold statement. <laughs> but uh, the idea is that, um, you know, it, it's your typical assignment. A student has to write a paper. Um, they do research on it. They give the paper to the instructor. The instructor reads it, grades it, and then it just sort of lives on a student's computer to like never be seen again. Whereas a renewable assignment provides students with opportunities to engage in meaningful work, add value to the world, and provide a foundation for future students to learn from and build upon. So renewable assignments are possible because of the permission to engage in the five R activities granted by open educational resources. So again, those five R's that we talked about earlier. So it's allowing students to curate and create work that doesn't you know, just live on a laptop eventually, um, but gets contributed to the curriculum with an open license, thus allowing them to be creators of shared knowledge for future learners. So now we're gonna look at um, some examples of, um, of renewable assignments. Uh, so student created open content. And one of my favorites here is this anthology called My, My Slipper Floated Away, New American Memoirs. Um, so this anthology was created by student, students sorry, at Lehman College in the Bronx as part of the CUNY system. And the writers are all immigrants, children of immigrants and or uh, POC, people of color. Uh, so I wanna read a quick description of um, this anthology from their website. So it says, they grew up hearing gunshots and sirens at night, played fire escape basketball and still celebrate Thanksgiving by dancing. The stories reveal the writer's intense longing to belong in America and their passion to succeed in this country while dealing with a myriad of challenges. They bear, they bear witness in riveting artful narratives that will be revelatory to Americans who fear and resent immigrants or people of color. So I wanted to read this because uh, this is an example where they specifically address what kind of social impact they wanted to have. So the instructor did that by allowing students um, to do this assignment where they tell their own story and then put it together into this collection of work. Um, so this would fall under the representational justice principle. So if we take a look at it real quick, you can see um, there's that description that I just read. Um, these are the student memoirs. These are the names of the people who contributed to it. So you can look through and read those things and you can see the CC licensing down here. Um, this is an example of something that is less open um, simply because um, uh, you, you probably wouldn't want derivatives of someone's personal story. Uh, you probably don't want to change that, but it is free to, um, to, to use and to share with others. All right. So the next example um, is one that is um, often used in these workshops, and it's this timeline of African-American rights, uh, the movement from 1950 to 1980. And this is an interactive timeline, which you know, just goes to show that these things aren't always, you know, contributing to like a book or a textbook that uh, this is also an educational resource that can be used by um, future students and was created by students. Um, so this was created by students from Tacoma Community College. And if we just sort of go through it, you can see there's these markers of important dates um, in history. And if you click on it, you can see uh, that there is these added um, descriptions and photos. So this is something where, you know, some of these students might not have ever learned of these uh, events in, in high school. Um, so they might have been learning this as they were creating this. So not only are they learning it, but they also get to create an educational object to be used by future learners. So that is this, which I think is a really great resource. So the next one is an open case study uh, created by students at the University of British Columbia. 
so in this assignment, students were tasked with creating case studies on important social justice movements in the 20th and 21st century. Again, so they're not just passively learning about the movements, but creating knowledge about them using uh, the UBC Wiki platform. So we're just going to take a quick look at that. And you can see, I'm not sure if this was done by a single student or a group of students, but um, it has information there. And uh, this is the course that it was assigned in. And you can see that the instructor has left some stuff here for students in this uh, class with this ass assignment, uh, including information on licensing and citations and open license material. And then at the bottom here, you can see other uh, works from this course. Um, and this is all open. So the next example is also from um, this um, uh, UBC uh, open platform. So this is uh, an open case study for uh, the Shuar indigenous people and local conservation. So this was uh, assigned by a faculty member in forestry at UCB or UBC, sorry. And specifically, um, what it addresses is why the struggles of the Shuar indigenous people in Ecuador to conserve their culture are key to local conservation. So it's a very specific topic, um, something I, you know, I would have probably never learned about um, in my high school um, or in, in college even. So just looking at this, um, you know, I, I don't know anything about this topic, so um, I wouldn't try to speak to its accuracy, but sort of from a library stand, a librarian standpoint, um, it looks very, you know, well researched to me. And so you can click on these uh, things and see more information um, as it goes. And this was created by a single student. Um, and if you go to the references, you can actually see that um, it was created by a student named Isabel. And you can see the Creative Commons licensing here and also down here. It also shows that this has been viewed over 63 times. That means this wasn't you know, something that was like a paper that was just turned into the uh, professor and then nobody else ever saw it. Um, at least 63 times, somebody has engaged with this resource, um, allowing them to learn about um, a population that has been marginalized or oppressed. So that is an example. And they actually have these open case studies uh, I have provided the link here. They have all kinds that you can look at. Um, I discovered this when I was putting together this presentation, but they have a lot of really cool things that you can look at um, on their um, sort of open platform for UBC. All right, so this is the last example. And what we see here is a group of undergraduate medical students uh, who use the open resource tool uh, MedEd portal to identify uh, open teaching resources that were related to LGBT uh, health issues. So what they did was they took that and they made a copy of it and then they made changes to reflect a UK context um, because it was in sort of the context of U the United States. So they made those changes and they were able to do that because it was um, open resources. And then they recorded digital stories from uh, patient interviews and combine these things to create a student-led LGBT healthcare 101. So this is probably a mix of recognitive justice as well as uh, representational justice. Uh, the recognitive justice is probably the LGBT resources that they found on MedEd portal. Although who knows, I'm not sure who authored those things. Um, that's, I'm just sort of assuming. Um, and then the representational justice is the inclusion of recorded digital stories from actual LGBT patients that they spoke to. So we looked at some student created open content. Um, these are some other ideas. Uh, is there something that you've tried before? Is there something that you want to try? Uh, does anybody have any examples that they'd like to bring up? I'd love to hear about it. If not, that's totally fine. 
Yeah, I, I really love that example, Sam. Um, Sam brought up that um, she worked with a kinesiology professor who uh, did a timeline like the one that we saw um, for female coaches. So uh, specifically identifying um, uh, female sports coaches, which probably doesn't get talked enough and talked enough about in that curriculum. And that, that was something that students contributed and made. Thanks for that example. Yeah, Carter, do you wanna unmute yourself? <clears throat> oh, hi. Hey. Um, yeah, this was actually um, a project that I did for um, one of my graduate classes. Our professor had us, um, it was English Renaissance, affect and emotion. Um, and they had us, use um, our knowledge to create like what like any type of like internet or outer kind of accessible um, pages or um, and for our example we made an Instagram page dedicated to apocalypse in the renaissance. Oh nice. Um, so it was I think it's also really great and just bridging that gap and showing students like that there's a connection between like the so-called real world and the work that we're doing in the classroom. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love the idea of putting putting what you work on in the classroom into a platform that like everyone can access, even people who are not um, who maybe not be privileged enough to go to um, you know a high costing university or college. Yeah, Sam also mentioned um, that Sarah and. Um, her worked with a music instructor who had students create music educational materials to be used in high schools as training. Um, that's awesome. I love that. And Joe mentioned LIS does some Google site flipped learning projects, which are technically open. Uh, yeah. Sorry, the chat's moving kind of fast, so I'm losing some of it. Um, awesome. Well, there's all kinds of ideas out there. Um, Oh, Pam said, in our course, we have students create online courses or modules so they can use them beyond the course. Awesome. I love that. These are great. Great. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. Like people have already taken part in this or are working on it or have done something um, that is a renewable assignment. That's awesome. So uh, can you think of any issues that might come with open pedagogy or renewable assignments? Mostly time, yes. Sort of going off of what Sam just said, um, I think that one of the thing, one of the critiques that I've heard that I think is a valid point is that asking students to write about personal experiences um, could potentially uh, be asking them to do emotional labor that they would not do if, with like a normal um, assignment, like if they just had to write a report or a paper, but, you know, asking them to sort of write about their experiences uh, could be traumatic and triggering. And that's oftentimes unpaid labor. And um, we, when any marginalized or oppressed group contributes their voice, I, you know, they with good reason, I think people should be paid for that. Um, so it, it's not quite the same as, you know, like, oh, well, they would have to do an assignment anyway, because it, it, it's a little different. So that is um, one point that I've heard before, and I think it, it's something worth thinking about. There's also technological issues, you know, um, you know, if your uh, technology is not functioning properly, then you might not be able to access it. Another one that someone brought up to me recently that I, I kind of didn't really think about was sustainability. So, you know, who, who's updating the information if there's new information being added or who's going in there and changing things? Um, is the platform or repository that it lives on, is that something that is um, guaranteed to be active um, indefinitely? Something to think about. Uh, Joe said, uh, People bring up issues with accuracy, credibility, authority. Um, yeah, I mean that that is one of the big things that come up that comes up in the uh, OER world and conversations.
Sam, the digital divide issue with online courses, absolutely. By guaranteeing that they have the bandwidth to create the online learning objects, absolutely. Yeah, these are all great. So, you know, it's, there, there are issues that could come up with this. Um, and it's something that I think that uh, instructors definitely should think about and consider uh, before they, um, you know, choose to go into doing a renewable assignment. <laughs> yeah, Joe mentioned that there's a double meaning in the bandwidth thing, uh, like literal bandwidth, bandwidth and mental bandwidth. That is true. All right, so um, I do have some resources on open pedagogy and I can, um, I think that I've already copied it, let me see. This should be the link to this presentation. So you should be able to access all of this. I just put it in the chat there, um, but it's um, some great resources about this topic. Um, there's this um, improving representation and diversity in OER materials um, published by OpenStax. And it's sort of this framework that I can just open it real quick. I know we're over time a little bit, but um, it has this table here and a component that you can look at sort of um, a description or requirement and then questions to sort of ask yourself um, when you are adapting or creating OER. Uh, so that is a very useful tool. Um, but there's all kinds of other things, including, you know, um, examples of more open pedagogy assignments here. Um, so please feel free to use those. And then just last minute, want to plug these webinars again, uh, the open educational resources at UNCG webinar is tomorrow at 2 p.m. And the next day there's engaging students online with Google, also at 2 p.m. And then, you know, a little uh, in the future, uh, when we come back, uh, Open Access Scholarship Basics is on January 7th at 11 a.m. And uh, Sam has put all those awesome links in the chat. These are the attributions from the content that I showed y'all, my bibliography, and that is it. Um, if you have any questions about this, um, you can email me or Sam. Sam, I, I threw you in there no, knowing that you probably were okay with that. Um, but uh, yeah, I can also uh, answer questions now. Yeah, Joe. Oh, I think Carter had one had their hand raised before me. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. I think I forgot to lower it. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's fine. I thought they usually would like lower themselves after a certain amount of time, but I think they stopped that. Right, like, yeah. <clears throat> um, hello, I'm Joe. Um, I know there's like problems with or you know extra thought that has to go into sharing information about students that are in classes with um, drawing a blank on the name of the rule but like one of the big you know can't share what class what students are in what classes for example and what their grades are so do you know offhand if there are any like extra steps you have to do to publish an open resource created by students like you know is it kind of understood that if students are contributing to it um, like if they don't want to contribute it, they could have like a separate assignment or is there like a disclaimer or a form that an instructor would have to do? Yeah, um, so I think it depends on the class. I don't think that there's anything like sort of official in terms of um, like agreeing on the copyright, but I what I've seen is, um, a, I've seen a form that uh, instructors have given their students that sort of like says that they understand that, um, the materials that they contribute to is going to be copyrighted in a way that it's open to the public and you know their name um, will probably be out there um, so i think that it just depends um i'm not sure exactly um if there's any sort of like administrative like steps other than that um so this is sam yeah sam <laughs> Um, sorry uh, to to come in. I um, the it really just depends on your institution, and um, like 
at UNCG, for example, um, I know like all the librarians here have heard me talk about this, but we have, you know, click wrap, but um, click, which is just that ITS has to approve the terms of use of any like online tool. But a lot of, a, a part of open pedagogy too, is a lot of times you're using these like open source tools and therefore they're freely available on the internet, which means you do have to adhere to copyright. So for example, in that um, music 205 class that Sarah and I worked with, um, we did a session on copyright so that students could understand getting open musical scores and musical materials to put on this open website um, as well. So did that kind of answer your question, Joe? Um, a little bit. I'm more thinking like, um, I think it's FERPA, I'd forget which one of those. Oh, so FERPA acronyms. is just to do with, um, and you know, I know there's instructional designers in here if they want to speak up, but FERPA is to do with um, pri is privacy data of grades. So it's okay, specific. making grades publicly available or um, sharing grades in a public space. That's why like, you know, we wouldn't recommend uh, using like new Google sites to teach a course, right? So like distribute the grades. Mm -hmm. um, but um, as long as you're keeping the grades out of it and out of the open content that is being produced in these projects, like um, in the examples Melody shared, right? Like the grades and how the grades were done are not really like a part of the final output, um, then you're fine. Um, and then with anything like what Melody was saying, um, you know, it's up to the student, like if a student didn't want to share their stories in one of those things, right? Like that would be between them and the instructor. and. They could usually have an opt out um, with these kind of like publications. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Melody, if that was no, that was that was helpful. I I always like to be reminded about FERPA. So yeah, FERPA is confusing. Um, who I don't know. Yeah, you know, like I said, I'm sure there are a little bit. Um, there's there's people I know that are here that are ex more expert on FERPA than me. Uh, but it, it, FERPA is mostly to do with student privacy and it's mostly to do with grades. Um, I will say that. Um, and again, if anyone wants to, I don't, I don't even remember my FERPA training from years ago. <laughs> um, so great. Are there any other questions? Cause I know we're at 1140 and um, this has been great. There's a lot of links in the chat. Um, so keep that in mind. I dropped a link to a quick assessment uh, to just, you know, uh, let us know how we did. Um, remember that uh, Melody dropped her slides on here. Um, Y'all will all get the recording for this when it is available. Um, typically, I can get it on YouTube faster than Zoom takes to process the transcript. Um, but usually, probably you'll get this at least by tomorrow. Usually, the only delay is the transcript process because I like to link out to the to the transcript when I send these out. Um, so like Melody said, um, be sure to keep the other webinars um, in mind um, as you're um, coming up. Um, and then um, I'm trying to keep up with the chat. So yeah, Pam um, shared, uh, we ask our students if it's okay to share. If there was someone who said no, then we look for alternatives. We That's have good them change settings um, to unlisted or private when using YouTube, et cetera. Um, you could have an agreement form. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, like with, I think for that time, the nice thing about something like timeline too, if that's something you ever are interested in is that those are not, those are like, when you publish them, you don't see a student name associated with them. Um, like with that Ken class I worked with, um, like you can see the coach timelines, right? And you could like embed them on a website, but you wouldn't, it doesn't have a creator um, tag unless you wanna put that in like a credits uh, sequence or not, but you can remove that if you want, um, which is a nice aspect of a lot of these open source tools. Okay, great. Thank you, Melody. Yeah, thank y'all. Um, thanks for coming, everyone, and have a great week and this uh, dreary start, but nice start with the webinar. All right. Bye, y'all.